So yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, I'm excited to be here, and I'm really kind of uh, impressed by so many people here. Like you know, to get this many people in an evening on a Tuesday for an STC meeting, I think is great. Um, and this is going to be a good topic. <clears throat> um, we're going to talk about trends and specifically the intersection between being a generalist versus a specialist in terms of, of jobs and other kinds of directions. Um, <clears throat> Lynn noted that I have a blog, right? I'd rather be writing. By the way, am I speaking correctly in this guy? I don't want to make sure. That was okay, I'll lean up a little bit. Um, I'm not really sure what the connection is between trends and blogging, but it seems like whenever the topic of trends comes up, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go read blogs to find the latest trends. So for the last, I don't know, five years, I've kind of done little posts here and there about trends, but last year I decided that, you know, looking at my web metrics, like trends posts are always hot, so why not dive into trends in a more thorough way and really try to figure out what the real trends are in, in the technical communication field rather than a speculative kind of wishy-washy, maybe this, maybe that. What if we could find real evidence for something more substantial so that you know when we talk about trends, it's not just um, one person's opinion. Um, and let, let me start by talking about why trends kind of intrigue us in the first place. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, hold on one sec, let me, let me do something. Uh, okay. I, I messed up something with my, with my domain because I went offline. Give me one sec here. Um, come back to this. I have this nifty little speaker panel here and I just want to drag it back over to my my side so I know what's coming up <laughs> but now that that's there I'll go full screen okay why do trends intrigue us um, if you look at some of the big companies that have been uh, once dominant in the field like Kodak and Blockbuster um, other ones, Borders, Radio Shack, Blackberry. You know, at one time these companies were at the top of their game, like they, they dominated the field. And then all of a sudden they sort of disappeared, right? One day Borders was just kind of closing up. Wow, that's probably a terrible example since I work for Amazon. But <laughs> one day Borders was kind of <laughs> closing up their doors, right? Radio Shack just sort of disappeared. Blackberry, you can still find them, but they're sort of collector's items now. Um, and <laughs> Uh, you know, sort of begs this question, why, what happened? You know, what happened to these companies? Why did they suddenly fail? And a lot of people say, well, they, they sort of rested on their laurels. They stopped innovating. They didn't continue doing the disruptive innovations that led them to the top in the first place. Instead, they just kind of did sustaining improvements. And eventually they were out, outmatched by a rising competitor who is, you know, doing more disruptive innovation. Well, these are companies, right? But could the same be said of technical writers, an actual job role? Could one day we wake up and find that we are like the Blackberries, that we're no longer employable, that we go around trying to market our resume and we're not getting buyers? Um, what, what is the possibility that technical writing as a role could be waning, slowly kind of fizzling out. And if so, you know, if this is a possibility, as all things trend and so forth, um, how can we avoid that, right? We don't want to wake up and suddenly realize that we've missed the boat on the training that we needed to be successful. Um, so this, this topic, I think, hits, at, hits us on a deep level, right? We're interested in trends because we know things change and we want to predict or we want to prepare ourselves for the future. We're also interested in to see where things are going, right? It's interesting in and of itself. Well, there was a, a, uh, a blog post by um, somebody that sort of articulated the deepest fear that I think most of us have in 
a podcast by Cherry Leaf. He, Ellis Pratt, is a great podcast, by the way. I highly recommend it. He um, goes over this post by a guy named Jim Gray, who's saying uh, that, that in his experience, the tech writer role is kind of dying out. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Gray, he says that he had, he had been meeting with all kinds of startups and companies and kind of finding out what their needs are. And he was constantly seeing that the, these technology companies were investing in UX designers rather than technical writers. And he, he comes to this conclusion. He says, technical writing is dying off. It's all about clean, engaging UX now. I've talked to more than 100 startup and small software companies as I've built my business. Almost none of them have technical writers, and almost all of them have UX designers. All right, so this, this fear about you know, the worst possible scenario with trends is that technical writers would be replaced by UX designers. And we've, we've seen some shift towards this direction, right? We have um, the UX writer roles kind of becoming more prominent, right, as writers move into the interface. But it still uh, you know, suggests this idea that maybe technical writers aren't you know, thriving. Maybe UX designers are thriving. Um, and what really has been the impact of UX design on the tech comm industry? Certainly, companies like Apple have cemented this idea that good design is what sells, right? You, you buy an Apple product not because you think, oh, it has great documentation. You buy it because you think, I'm not gonna need the documentation. It will be intuitive and simple, right? And, and of course, that's not the case, but that is the, the brand. Um, and you know, they, they set the, the pace for all these other companies that strive to have this super easy user experience. So where does TechDocs fit into that direction? Um, well, in order to try to evaluate the kind of uh, long-term uh, thriving of tech jobs and whether they are diminishing or increasing or staying the same, we turn to the Bureau of Labor S Statistics on job growth. Um, if you look, the, the BLS does some great tracking of employment trends. And uh, this is actually also rolled up under the STC's publication called the, the Salary Database. Right? It just pulls from the same source. And if you look at the last six years or so, starting at 2012, you find that there were 46,200 technical writers. And then in 2014, there were 48,200. And then in 2016, 49,800. And 2017, 50,000 which represents about an 8.2% growth rate for the tech comm industry. If you compare that to software developers and programmers, uh, this is another category in the BLS uh, database. It actually combines a few. Um, they break this down into like software developers who are uh, systems, systems applications, as well as other types of software developers and computer programmers that are more focused on hardware and web developers, but I've lumped them all into this larger umbrella. In 2012, they had 1.4 million and it grows a little bit faster. In 2017, 1.6 million. This only represents those in the United States, not outside of the United States. And 2012 is kind of the, the farthest year you can go back because prior to that, they classified roles differently and they, they did different methodologies for how they collected data. So if you go to the BLS website and you're like, where's the previous year's button? They don't have it. Um, you, you have to, I actually, yeah, I, I, uh, I wrote them, I said, where are the previous years? And they explained this. They basically need to start in 2012 and that's it. Um, so you can see that although, you know, technical writing as a profession in terms of pure numbers isn't going down, it's also not necessarily keeping pace with those we support. I think of it like, 
your annual merit increase, right? Where you get maybe 2% or something, um, but the cost of living is jumping to 5% or whatever it is. Maybe that's too extreme, but you know, you could say, of course, I'm not getting less money, but in a way I kind of am. Um, <clears throat> all right, now <clears throat> to do a few more growth comparisons. The average of all professions is seven, is grow, the growth rate for, for all professions is 7%. So uh, technical writers growing, I have 11% here. This is kind of uh, looking at uh, what the STC salary database is, is doing rather than the numbers straight from the BLS. But 11%, 17% and so forth. Um, what this means is that if you're supporting you know, one tech writer for every 33 developers today, in a few years, maybe you'll have uh, 35 developers that you support and so forth. It's not that big of a deal. Um, the BLS does say, they sort of give their, their outlook. They say job opportunities, especially for applicants with technical skills, are expected to be good, right? Uh, I surveyed my readers and just kind of wanted to get their impression on whether their workloads, in terms of the number of engineers they support, is growing or decreasing. Uh, the question to which they agree or disagree is, the number of engineers I support seems to be growing each year, making the ratio of tech writers to engineers more lopsided with fewer tech writers and more engineers. 35% strongly agree, 41% agree. So, that's a really difficult sort of judgment to make, right? Like, if you think about how many teams you support, it probably fluctuates a lot. It's hard to pin down. Um, but are you, are you supporting more and more engineers? You know, are engineers growing at a faster rate than technical writers? And are you actually seeing that in your workplace? And how does that impact trends in tech comm? Um, all right, well, I was actually down in an academic conference in Louisiana a while ago, and uh, I was a little more alarming about the trend, this growing disproportion, right? The 15, 17% versus half that for tech writers. And here are some common objections. They said, well, how consistent is their methodology? Uh, for example, you know, how are they, <clears throat> how are they classifying things? Uh, or, or are they consistent from year to year, right? Which I found that after 2012, they are consistent, and prior to that, they're not. But another question was, are job titles you know, too diverse to measure? Maybe you're an information engineer, and another person is a content strategist, and another person is a um, you know, documentation specialist. Do those get counted? Yes, they, they actually do. There's only three categories in the BLS data. It's technical writer, editor, or what was the third one? Maybe fiction writer or something. Uh, I can't remember what the third one was, but in the technical writer category, there's this one, and they, they sort of have a, a general description that HR company or HR groups match to. So uh, there's not a lot of fluctuation in that. Another, another person asked, well, maybe the growth is happening outside the US, so you don't really see, you don't really see this, this um, percentage keeping pace with the engineers because we're having more people in Poland and more people in Ireland and, and in India. Um, and I tried to find, like, how do I get the BLS data for Ireland and Poland? And they don't really exist, or at least not to the level where technical writers are measured. But they are really taking off in Ireland. The whole Doc Force tool um, has a huge like group of writers that, they, that work through Ireland and Poland as well. But uh, would that offset this ratio and make it more balanced? It's hard to say. Um, and then another question, has user-generated content, you know, content people are posting to YouTube and to blogs and so forth that are tech tutorials, has that sort of replaced the need for technical writers? Could that account for why, you know, technical writers aren't growing as fast as engineers? And again, impossible question to answer. I don't know how you could, uh, come up with any kind of conclusive data about that. Certainly, you know, many people just turn to uh, Google and, and online sources uh, outside of a company's official documentation for answers, but it seems like the majority of documentation might not just be readily available like that. So 
the, trying to figure out, you know, is the tech comm profession growing or shrinking? It's a tough question to answer, right? Uh, Ellis Pratt, he runs a, a, a company that finds technical writers for companies and they also do some training. But he says, I think there is a truth in saying that the role of the technical author is changing and the requirements and the skills that they need are changing as well. Um, but it doesn't actually kind of pin down exactly how they're changing, at least not in his podcast. He is actually doing some more uh, presentations around this, so I'm excited to see what, what his thoughts are. But, and, and they call them technical authors in the UK, by the way. Uh, but uh, it, it, this is the central question. There seems to be widespread agreement that the technical writer role is changing, right? How can you disagree with this, given that you know, technology changes so rapidly and we're in this tech space? Uh, how could our role not also be changing along with this highly dynamic and, and uh, constantly evolving space? But what direction? What, what is the evolution? Are we, are we slowly fizzling out? Are we ramping up, staying the same? Uh, and what kinds of um, more specific directions might we be following? Uh, for example, what about the, well, that didn't qu quite come out there, the, the direction from PDF to web, that's supposed to be an arrow. Um, that was a huge thing at the turn of the century, right? All the docs were going online into HTML, and then we had the semantic web and XML, and things were being, uh, made more, uh, some, they were being made more semantically aware. It wasn't just tags. And then we had the wikis where people said, you know, documentation will now be crowdsourced and everybody's a technical writer. You don't have to be an official writer. You just jump in there and your documentation suddenly gets written. And then Dita comes along and it's, you know, this more structured methodology and, and way of writing in a way that can be <clears throat> more uh, integrated and leveraged into larger systems and shared. Uh, content strategy and social media, these are two big things, right? With social media, when, when these different channels came out, a lot of the discussion was about how do we push our content across Twitter and across Facebook and across uh, the multi -channel, multiple channels that our company has. And, Content strategy was a, a huge uh, shift as well, where people started to look and see beyond just um, <clears throat> the, the, the written document, but looking at the whole like life cycle of it, who creates it and who governs it and when does it die and what are all the touch points with the customer and how do we, how do we uh, have a consistent kind of interaction uh, from this whole larger perspective. Chatbots are another recent one where now people say that um, you know, this, this idea that you can uh, uh, provide an interaction point, people can ask questions, get responses, requires us to chunk up our content, chunk, chunk up our, our um, documentation into little snippets that are tagged semantically in the system and can be leveraged in different ways. Uh, augmented reality is something I frequently hear more commonly in the hardware space, but you know, you're, you're doing machinery documentation, and you want to be able to project an image of it and have people manipulate it. The Internet of Things is also a huge trend. This refers to lots of little devices that are all con that are you know connected online from your toaster or your refrigerator to uh, maybe this podium. Um, AI is a huge focus as well, right? This idea that that these interconnected things are smart, that they trigger actions based on sensors and data automatically. Um, you know, it's raining and maybe because it's raining, your temperature's changed in your house and uh, you have other kind of conditions uh, automatically going into effect. Well, these are a lot of different directions. And over the years, we've sort of um, heard people come onto the scene and say, this is the next big thing, right? This is. This is where, where we're going. Like there was a whole conference about chatbots. Lots of people went to it and um, you know, I, I, I didn't go and maybe, maybe that was a mistake or maybe it wasn't a mistake. You know, it's like, how do you decide which 
sort of angle to put your energy into? Should you reinvent yourself as a content strategist because that's the thing uh, that is gonna be more beneficial to your company as well as like marketable as a skill? Or is that just kind of a new trending buzzword that doesn't really connect in what employers are looking for? There's a lot of unknowns about trends that make it a quagmire to sort through. Um, so what can we use in order to really sort through fact from fiction here in terms of what's really worth paying attention to? Well, one tool that academics have used to try to figure out what's a reliable barometer for trends is the job ad. Um, if you look at job ads and code for the keywords that people are asking for, and academics do this with great amounts of detail and meticulousness, um, then you can kind of see, well, are people asking for content strategy skills? Are people asking for chatbot skills? Are people asking for data skills? And it's where the rubber meets the road. You can say, well, uh, yeah, like in all these positions, they want X, so that's probably worth paying attention to. And if they don't ask for them, then maybe it's not worth paying attention to. There's a, a couple of um, studies that I wanna cite. One is by Brumberger and Lair in 2013. It's really comprehensive. If you have access to the STC journals, check this out um, and I'll give you sources later. But they looked at about uh, 1,000 or so jobs within the umbrella of tech comm, which includes grant writing, medical writing, social media, content management, um, and they broke them down. I'm sort of focusing on the uh, technical writer editor, writer editor category, of which half of the jobs were. And within the technical writer slash editor category, right here, uh, these are the skills that they uh, gleaned from all the job ads. 75% are looking for candidates with written communication, 51% editing, 49% project planning and management, 49% visual communication, 45% subject matter familiarity, 41% working with SMEs, and 40% style guides and standards. Now, there's a lot to sort through, and uh, if you've ever tried to look at a job ad and try to like pick out the right parts of it, to sort of code it like this, it's not an easy challenge at all. Um, but I, I'm sort of drawn to this one here, subject matter familiarity, um, because I, I've seen it in other studies as well. If we go back even further, in 20, or 2006, another person, Clinton Lanier, did a similar study you know, academics, it makes sense for them to do this study because they're training students to be, and they want them to be successful after they graduate, right? Otherwise, their program's not gonna thrive if they can't get a job after that. So they have to figure out what skills to teach the students to thrive, right? Well, <clears throat> in this study, Lanier focused on jobs that didn't require any more than a couple of years of experience that actually said technical writer in the title and he looked at about 327. He found that of these, 33% were looking for subject matter experience, 34% subject matter writing experience, which is an interesting distinction, 26% subject matter knowledge, and 17% technical writer specific skills. You know, he, he breaks down this, this uh, sort of subject matter familiarity a little more granularly than the other person. But there's a predominant theme in there, in his research, that, hey, this is what a lot of people are looking for, and they've been looking for these subject matter familiarity skills for the last, like, 15, 20 years. It's not, it's not a new thing. It's a, constant, it's a constant theme. This provoked a discussion about whether it's better to be a generalist or a specialist, right? If, if you want if these, these companies want you to have specific subject matter familiarity, should you throw your whole energy in learning everything about one specific thing, thing so that you can have in-depth knowledge, maybe 
Maybe you're, you're gunning for a Python documentation job, so you spend all you know, summers and years just ramping up on Python, and then you're suddenly qualified. Or is it better to be a generalist, where you know, maybe you know a little bit of Python, but you also know a little bit about neural networks, and you know a little bit about artificial intelligence, and you know a little bit about you know, putting together publishing systems and style checking tools and other sort of skills. Well, the, the academics in this article say that, you know, if you're a generalist, um, it gives you a little more room to pivot around. If something doesn't work out, let's say, you know, you can't find any jobs involving Python, but you've got some involving neural networks, well, you know, you can pivot around. Or if you, if you have similar sort of skills, let's say you're really good at web analytics, you don't find anything involving that, but you're also good at SEO, you know, well, those two kind of complement each other. So if you can find uh, complementary skills, maybe you're, you're an information architect, but you're also really good at kind of uh, layout, web design, you know, and doc tools, those sort of specializations complement each other. Um, Basically, it's, it's a great discussion that has continued on through many other articles about where it makes the most sense to put your time and energy. And that's sort of what I'm focusing on, on here. Like, should you be a generalist or should you be a specialist? Uh, let's look at a few common sort of examples. This, this, is, this is a job, actually. Is this the job we have open? We actually have a job open on our team, if you're interested. Um, and this may be the posting, or maybe it was another one. But most job descriptions, at least for a lot of jobs in the Bay Area, have a common theme as well. They want you to know a certain technology already. And uh, for example, if we were to kind of read this one, it would say, you know, the candidate should be familiar with should be able to read one or more common programming languages such as Java, Python, or something else, JavaScript. Um, and I pulled kind of my readers to find out, is this a similar experience that you're seeing as well? Are you finding that in job ads that subject matter familiarity is sort of a key requirement from the start? And a lot of people agreed. 45% said yep, and 22%, of course yes, a uh, few people are undecided, 20%. But for the most part, when you're looking for a job, you run into this dilemma that they sort of want you to know a specific technology already out of the gate. And they vary pretty dramatically. It's not as if they're just a couple or two or three and that's it. No, it's, uh, it varies considerably. I, I got an email the other week from one of my friends who uh, wrote me and he let me share his email. He says, <clears throat> hi Tom, I found out what it is like to be a technical writer at X. It is a death sentence. After <laughs> X company bought our company and after a period of settling in, they created an org chart. Then they gave me my notice. Without telling us at the beginning, X does not hire technical writers but developers that write docs. So all this time they were waiting until the right time to give me the notice. Um, we would had some discussions about stuff over the years and, and uh, talking about API documentation. He was so excited to be working in his company and then just like out of the blue you know, gets, gets this ax because he's not a developer. Clearly the company has some kind of brand of developers writing for other developers, kind of like um, people who can understand each other, people who are on the same wavelength. You uh, kind of like if you were to, you know, market a publication to technical writers as, you know, this is written by other technical writers who understand you and your needs kind of thing. Well, um, this is sort of an alarming thing, right? Because it suggests that now, in order to thrive in this tech writing profession, I have to become a developer, uh, which is a whole other level of expertise, not just sort of knowing a programming language or being able to kind of pick out different key parts of it to understand it, but to actually have job experience as a developer. Got another email. Actually, I got this one 
very recently, this person wrote and said, <clears throat> he was telling me about his job escapades and his re most recent one, he said, in addition to creating, he had just come back from a job interview, he said, in addition to creating API documentation and, and other technical content, they wanted me to put together the documentation portal to look like Twilio's, to write white papers, and to work on other marketing collateral. All right, so here, not only does the person, the, the, the hiring team, want the person to have strong technical knowledge to write all this API docs, although not to the level of being a developer. Uh, they also want them to be a tools wizard to build a, a doc portal that looks like Twilio's, you know, which you know is not going to be an insignificant feat. They have UX designers and developers you know, working on something like that, and then to also write a bunch of marketing material, white papers, other kind of marketing collateral. Um, so here, this person is asked to be a jack of all trades, um, or to be both a generalist and a specialist, right? Well, this is a, a, a dilemma that doesn't seem to go away, and there's a great scenario that's fun in a torturous way to try to contemplate. But imagine that you have, imagine that you're a hiring manager and you're hiring for a technical writer position on your team and the audience for the tech docs are somewhat t are technical. They're like developers or, or some other type of engineers. And you have a couple of candidates. You have a candidate who's super strong in tech but doesn't have much writing experience. You've got a candidate who's got a ton of writing experience, but is only kind of mediocre in their technical skills. Which person do you hire for the job? Uh, whenever I bring this scenario up, like it provokes all kinds of strong reactions because the, the kind of way I see this often playing out is that the, the, the technical, the, the candidate who's stronger technically tends to win out. There's a post on Reddit where this topic sort of came up and somebody said, in the technical writing Reddit forum, they said, I work in engineering documentation, so I would always choose a candidate that has solid domain expertise, even if they only have adequate writing skills. It's easier to train the writing skills than teach the domain expertise. All right, and so, now I'm not saying the technical candidate always wins, but it seems like more often than not, the technical candidate sort of gets the edge over the writing candidate. Writing is kind of diminished to wordsmithing only, where the person with writing skills is seen as somebody who is you know, excellent at grammar and you know, style and flow, maybe organization, but that's it, right? Um, part of the reason why in these interviews, the technical candidate wins is because it's much easier to evaluate technical skills than it is writing skills. For example, if you're a hiring manager and you've got a bunch of boxes to check, right? Super easy to find out if the person knows HTML. You could just view the source of any web page and ask them to walk, talk you through it. And if they can't, well, they fail that, right? But if you, if you have to try to analyze their writing, how do you check for, uh, analysis, organization, distillation, thoroughness, concision, it's impossible, especially from a sample about a product you, you don't really know, you don't know the history of the document or their level of like involvement or, or what. It's really hard to kind of extrapolate the person's writing skills from a simple sample. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying it's, it's hard to know. Did they? interact with the customer to gather requirements? Did they have to pull the information out of engineers' heads? Did engineers give them a document they just edited? You know, does it even make sense if I don't know the product? How can I possibly judge that? You know, are the steps accurate? Who knows? Like, I don't have access to the product. Um, so because writing is so much more fuzzy, then the tech skills get prioritized in, in, their, in, the, in the evaluation criteria for jobs. As a result, a lot of technical writers have started to hybridize their titles. You know, it's no longer cool to say I'm a technical writer. You have to sort of add a hyphen there or an, a slash and be, well, I'm a technical writer and editor or a technical writer and a content strategist 
or I'm an information architect slash tech writer. I'm a tech writer and a project manager. I'm a technical writer and I'm an information designer. And uh, you know, we've seen this proliferation of new titles. I'm a strategic content development something, whatever, not a technical writer. Um, I went to this conference a while ago. Uh, this is a SAP. And, and they were like, yeah, we, we don't really use, actually the person warned me ahead of time. They said, you know, Tom, uh, we don't use the term technical writer around here. We're information developers. So, you know, if you want to connect with the audience, just use the word information developer. And I was like, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> But it sort of reinforces my point that it's no longer good, to, it's no longer cool to be a technical writer because the writing skills are just sort of, uh, they're undervalued. Um, we live in a day where people write emails all day. And so the act of writing um, doesn't seem to be a super specialized skill anymore. <clears throat> if you were to kind of look at the larger technology landscape and ask why is it that writing skills seem to be underplayed. Is technology itself getting more complex? And if technology is getting more complex, is this driving up the value of, of technical knowledge, kind of like a, a supply and demand? If you look at uh, the left here, I've got a lot of diagrams up here. In, 20, in 2005, we had a lot more single vendor systems. Like if you had a Microsoft stack, you had the Microsoft database and the Microsoft server, and it was all kind of a single vendor technology. But in 2016, you have an explosion of different technologies. Um, uh, lots of different server platforms and, and parts from different companies all working together um, in a much more complex way. There's also this proliferation of APIs. Companies develop an API, another company develops another API, another company develops a th another API, and users are kind of interacting with all of them. But these APIs weren't necessarily um, thought to interact together. Uh, so we suddenly have a lot of untested scenarios where things that weren't built together are now being integrated, which adds a lot of complexity. The JavaScript world is also a huge explosion of technology. If you look at just all the JavaScript languages, it seems like every week somebody reinvents JavaScript with a new language, and it's kind of ridiculous almost. Um, I was reading this thread on Reddit about how somebody said, why do we keep reinventing these things? We've already solved these problems. People said, we didn't, you know, we've, we've solved them in better ways, or the new languages do something the old just couldn't quite do. Um, there's also the iceberg sort of model that's, that's cropping up. And this is, this is the idea that on the surface, things are getting simpler, like my phone, right? You, did you read the manual for your phone? Probably not, right? Because it's getting simpler. Do you read the manual to use Google? No. But if you were to go to Google's homepage, click view source and copy all the source code and paste it into Microsoft Word, it's around 73 pages long. And, and really this comes down to um, who's your audience. If you're writing for people, if you're writing end user documentation on how to use Google to do a search, it's probably pretty easy. If you're writing documentation that explains how the search algorithm works, uh, that's gonna be a lot harder, right? So on the front end, things might be getting simpler and maybe systems are being simplified so that they can be administered by less technical people, there's still a greater degree of complexity that's going on in the background. Now, one of the things I'm currently documenting is how, how the whole video skill thing works with uh, Fire TV. You know, if you wanna say, hey, play, Alexa, play Bosch, right? From a user's point of view, simplifying the, the experience. You don't have to figure out how to navigate where Bosch might be located, what season, right? You can tell the exact season you want. Well, on the back end though, to explain to developers what they need to do in order to make that work is a lot more complicated. You know, there's APIs that are sending requests, other than you have to receive them, you have to act on them, you have to send the communication back to your app, you've got to authorize things, there's a lot going on. Um, so this question uh, is another unanswerable one. Is technology getting more complex or less complex? And is that complexity driving this sort of preference for the technical candidate? It's hard to say. 
But I would say that, uh, you know, in, in many cases for the developer side, sure. And for the end user side, maybe not. Uh, among the academic, other academic articles, there's one that really stands out by a couple of people who published in IEEE about why docs fail for developers. They were looking at API docs and other sort of uh, developer docs. They wanted to know what's, what's the root cause? Why is, why is this documentation not working for the developers? And they found that there are problems that are, are hard to solve without kind of a deep knowledge of things. Incompleteness, ambiguity, unex... Whoa. <laughs> oh, I think I might have hit a button, sorry. The middle button is the blank one, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Obsoleteness, inconsistency, incorrectness, right? The problems for which documentation fail aren't because of typos or because of poor branding or because uh, the person used gerunds instead of action verbs. It's because of deep things, you know? The, the description wasn't clear of this thing. It's ambiguous what this class does. And they conclude, they say, perhaps unsurprisingly, the biggest problems with API documentation were also the ones requiring the most technical expertise to solve. Completing, clarifying, and correcting documentation required deep authoritative knowledge of the API's implementation. This makes accomplishing these tasks difficult for non-developers or recent contributors to a project. Uh, so the question is, you know, does a person need specialized knowledge in order to write documentation that clarifies and you know, corrects and, and fixes all the problems in, a doc in documentation? And they conclude that, that yes. You know, so this again is an argument that this candidate who you're deciding, you know, do I go with the more techie or the better writer? Uh, the techie tends to win in part because this is really the sort of knowledge you need to fix docs at a fundamental level. So if you were to look at where are we going, it's kind of, it looks kind of like this. The technical technical writer sort of beating out the less technical writer in job candidates. And AKA, or in other words, the tech specialist is the one who seems to be um, getting the edge. Uh, and it's kind of funny, I was talking with my friend who uh, actually when I flew in here, I met up with a great old friend, it was awesome, we chatted for like three hours, and I was telling him, yeah, I was kind of talking about trends and how, you know, the more, the, the technical, technical writers sort of getting the edge, and he laughed at this term. But all the technical writers I've talked to know exactly what this refers to, so it's sort of this term that I, that I like. Um, now, I'm not gonna end here, so just you know, stay tuned. I'm not kind of pronouncing this doom and gloom. I've got more twists and turns in the plot here. But um, th this feels true as a direction. Uh, the job ads seem to support it. The industry seems to support it. You know, if you go to some place, and maybe this is my Silicon Valley bias and the fact that I'm surrounded by all these developer companies, right? And in the software domain, people have said, you know, Tom, you're in a bubble. It's way different in Virginia. It's way different in Germany. It's totally different in Australia. But, you know, the technical knowledge that you have is a constant theme in job ads and in postings, I think, globally. And so this is one no matter what direction you go, developing this more technical foundation seems to be a strategy for not getting left behind. Uh, one question might be, well, how exactly do we learn technology? This is, this is way easier to say than do. Uh, I, I polled people, I said, how much time do you think you need to spend each day just learning tech to keep up? And then how much time do you actually spend? People said, oh, maybe half hour is what they spend, or 60 minutes even, like 13%. But most people, eh, zero to 20 minutes. So not a strong amount of learning is going on. One very, very popular technique is this, this technique called the Pomodoro method. Have you ever used this? This is, um, 
This screenshot here is like the digital Pomodoro. Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. It refers to these little timers that you just set and you turn and it kind of ticks and so forth. Well, you set a timer for 20 minutes and you kind of throw yourself into some tutorial or, or some you know, learning progression. And you try to do, uh, you, you try to focus on that for 20 minutes and then take a break, right? And, and you can knock off little chunks of work like this. And over time, you begin to see that, wow, I'm actually learning whatever it is. Um, th this has worked for me. It works for my wife, for, for her studies. She does this with, she's taking a, reading a bunch of history books and some of them are very long and she does this. Her little Pomodoro timer goes off and I'm like, oh, she's finished something. Um, but this is, this is one way to learn it. There are lots of tips for how to learn technology. Most say, get your hands on with a project, experiment with something, make it real, make it relevant, right? And uh, I don't wanna go too far into that, but one thing I, I have realized and noticed is that when I dive into these Pomodoros, after like five or six of these, sort of changes my mental state um, and I think learning has this effect that it, it creates more like plasticity in your brain, if that's a, a thing. I feel like the, the sort of neural pathways are loosened up and they're, they're more flexible and like things are kind of in a different state where I can then tackle and learn other things, maybe totally unrelated to what I was learning. Um, it puts me in a state that helps me write great docs because now I'm writing for other learners and I'm, I'm in this learning mindset. Um, now, uh, another question might be, you know, when do you do all this learning? When do you sink time into learning technology? It seems like a lot of effort and so forth. You know, and I have four kids at home and I have other, you know, commitments. Actually, the four kids pretty much wipes me out. Uh, so I don't have many other commitments beyond all their activities, but um, it's hard to find time to do this. And I, I, was, I would do like three, three tech Pomodoros at work first thing, and I like, learned so much and feel so engaged, but then when I'm done with the third one, it's already one o'clock or two o'clock, hit another meeting, all of a sudden half the day is gone, I haven't written a thing. Uh, my productivity is just kind of like going downhill, so I'm staying later, you know, it's, it's difficult to try to fit this in, right? And eventually I give up and be like, ah, oh, it's so depressing and it's just, you know, learning technology, I'm much more creative. I want to ask why, not just how. Um, and uh, I was at a conference last month, TC Camp in Santa Clara. And there was a guy who was, I thought he was really smart because TC Camp is a sun conference where you sit at a table and you just kind of chat with people about topics you're interested in. And he had some great analogies around like how we learn. He said, you, you, you follow the pattern of the Nautilus. That this is a, a kind of outward spiral that goes bigger and bigger. It's like you start simple and you get bigger and bigger. And we started talking about like technology and I asked him, do you think the, the future of what all these companies are looking for is the technical, technical writer? Um, <clears throat> because he, he works for a staffing company that specifically tries to you know, place technical writers in with these companies or, or provide resources. And he said, actually, there's a bit of a disconnect. <clears throat> he said, there's, there's a disconnect between what companies say they want and what they actually need. They say they want technical, technical writers, but they really, what they really want is to improve their customer experience. The technical, technical writer isn't necessarily going to do that. This is Paul Gustafsson from Expert Support. In other words, um, you know, if you peel back the reasons why a company's hiring, it's because maybe their docs suck. They're like, we gotta improve our documentation or we've got a lot of docs. We want, we want not only for the docs to be written, but for the, comp the customers to love them. Is having somebody who's deeply technical going to address the customer experience problem? And he says, not necessarily. Um, Instead, uh, the sort of writing model that's getting left behind is this more close focus on the user. Um, if you look on the left, this is not really the writing model where you have a writer who's interacting with the, the, 
technology product and, and writing how it works, right? We've all been taught the rhetorical triangle. There's a third component in here, the reader, the user. The writer, sure, interacts with technology, but in the context of the user. And I feel like, you know, in, in all of, in this era where the technical, technical writer is sort of winning the game, I don't think it's really, I don't think the person's winning the ultimate goal of, of improving that customer experience because you need a writer who's not only conversant with the technology, but more somebody who can dive deeply into the customer's mind and experience, asking questions such as, what's the customer experience journey with our products? What's the customer experience on competitors' products? Um, what are the pain points in our customer experience? What customer experience can we infer from web analytics? What insights do we get from surveys from our customers? What are people saying or writing about our products? Um, there's a lot about the user that I think gets overlooked. Um, I was actually uh, writing a really different sort of report last year where I, where I was comparing one of our products, the products I was documenting, with a competitor product, a, a competitive analysis between Fire TV and Roku. In terms of the developer journey, what does it take for a developer to develop an app for Fire TV, and what are those same steps for Roku? How do they compare? You know, and I was like, this is, my manager gave me this task, and at first I said, we have a group that does benchmarking, we have people that do this, you know, like, you wanna go find out about Roku, we'll just sign, assign a ticket to them. But they're like, no, 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 we're gonna do this for visibility too, people will get to know you. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, and so I, I, I started out on this, this huge undertaking, building a Roku app from scratch, you know, publishing it on their system, publishing a similar app on Fire TV, had like 40 pages where I laid out the developer journey. Well, it's like first they have to have an interest, you know, and then they evaluate platforms, they figure out what, whether it's worth developing, and then they're gonna have to sign up on the site. Right? And then they're going to have to uh, figure out what frameworks or templates are available and weigh the pros and cons about languages they know versus what's offered. Then they consult documentation and sample apps. You know, then they're going to test it. And they're going to upload it. And they're going to do some more testing and publishing and looking at analytics. So I kind of went through this whole timeline, wrote 40 pages of content. I was like, all right, I'm done. And uh, people were really, really excited about that. Like, it was something that... that caught a lot of people's attention who normally don't really care much about docs, but suddenly I was looking at more than just docs. It was, this is the customer experience, especially you know, illuminated by juxtaposing it with another customer experience. And uh, even though that took a lot of time, I think it was very worthwhile because now you know, I learned things. Like in Roku, they don't call them apps, they call them channels. Now I could write better docs because now I have better sense of terminology. You know, and even now, I'm, I'm writing about video skills. Well, what does Google Assistant call their skills? They don't call them skills, they call them actions, right? This kind of awareness of going across the product to understand, you know, a developer, they're not just writing code for Amazon, they're writing it for lots of different platforms and interacting with other documentation uh, that uses other terminology. Um, it's, it's helpful because I think it, it's gonna inform the documentation overall to be a better final experience. Um, I was actually presenting this, this at the STC Summit and one person said, you know, it's great and all to focus on the customer experience and to say that it can sort of trump this tech knowledge ultimately, um, but how do you possibly like persuade anybody in a company that that's the case? People still just default to, oh, you know, what tech do you know? And the person was very, very right in the sense that <clears throat> uh, there's a huge culture where engineering-driven companies really privilege and, and favor engineering knowledge. And so if you try to you know, play this customer side and say, well, I know the customer experience and this is the customer's focus, you might just sort of fall on deaf ears. So I think um, any kind of awareness begins with feedback from the user. You know, how do you know what the customer experience of your docs even is? This is one of the most difficult questions to answer, in part because we don't you know, see the customer. If you're a teacher, 
you've got students, you can see if your lessons work well. If you're a doctor, you meet with patients, they come back or, or whatever, and you see if the prescriptions or treatment helped. If you're uh, in many other jobs, you can directly observe the impact. But with, with docs, like you're kind of writing to an empty room that you can't really see. So trying to capture what the experience is and to sort of gather that up seems like one of the first steps. Um, and I don't have a lot of like insight on this. I think this is something that I'm still trying to figure out and hopefully maybe when we get into more discussion here, you can, you can add your tips on how you sort of quantify and metric or the experience. I sort of have this dream that, um, I mean, since, since I work at Amazon, I think our documentation should have similar Amazon characteristics, like little ratings and stars. And you should be able to say, oh, this is a four-star topic or this is a two-star topic. And if it's a two-star topic, you should like do everything in your power to change it and bring it up. But people don't really rate things reliably. I've tried this. Um, <laughs> it's hard to figure out how to do that. Um, you know, but, but the idea is, how do you grab what's in the customer's head, somehow make it data that goes to the product team so that they begin to see whether you know, the documentation is making an impact or not? Uh, otherwise, they may just default to this idea that, oh, the technical writer is not technical enough or something. All right, final slide. Uh, this is a quote from Mark Baker, who was once a great icon in our industry, but then retired, oh, for whatever reason. He wrote the blog, Every Page is Page One. And he says, we got into this debate about whether it's better to be a generalist or specialist. And he said, this is where the heart of technical communication lies, in the intersection of rhetorical acuity and technical acuity. The great debate in technical communication is whether the intersection can be achieved by a writer and an engineer working together, each bringing half of the equation, or whether it has to be by one person possessing both acuities. I tend to be in the latter camp. In other words, you know, we, we kind of have this model that we've got two specialists, a language specialist or communication rhetorical specialist and a tech specialist, and they sort of work together to build this product, right? Which is kind of how it goes. Um, but, but does that work? Can you have two people operating or do you really need the writer to have all this technology as he or she is making decisions, uh, the, the many, many micro decisions, decisions along the way? Um, all right, if you want more reading, I have a whole essay on this. This is called uh, Principle 11 in a series I have called Simplifying Complexity. You can go to that short link and you can read more about it. And, and I wanna start into a discussion, but before we do, I have a three question survey that will prime the discussion here. So if you, uh, let's see, how many people, if you've got a phone or whatever, go to this first link. I'd rather be writing .site slash tsurvey2 and take, answer the three questions there. Uh, this is a short link. It'll go to some other site. <clears throat> and take a couple minutes to express your agreement or disagreement with the three questions, and then we'll look at the results, and then we'll, we'll jump into some discussion. Questions are basically, you know, do you agree or disagree with some of the arguments I've been making, or do they align with your own experience? Um, and then in a sec, we'll just look at the results. Yeah, sorry about that. I'd rather be writing dot site slash T survey and then put the word two. If you don't want, if you don't put two, you go to a different survey that go that was the uh, previous time I was giving this at the summit. I'm kind of curious to know whether these are going to be similar or not.
Okay, all right, let's take, is everybody done? No. No? Okay, all right, sorry, I'll give you another minute. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'm a slow typer. Okay. Crank this open to see how many people. There are about 20 people in there. And only about oh, 21 viewed, 14 started. Uh, maybe some people don't have phones or they're not interested. Either way, I think we're good. Uh, first one, technical, technical writers are more likely to win job interviews even over other candidates with better writing skills, especially when interviewing for developer documentation roles. 54% agree, 23% strongly agree. Okay, only a few people disagree. Some people are like, nope, nope. Maybe they have a whole line of reasoning that would convert us all. All right, uh, second one, customer experience problems with docs aren't solved in significant ways by hiring more technical, technical writers. 54, wow, same people, whoa, it's like almost the exact same. 54% agree, 23% strongly agree. And again, somebody disagrees, and some people are neutral. Last question, less technical, technical writers. Again, terrible term, but it's kind of understood can overcome the perceived shortcomings about technical depth by expanding and communicating their ex expertise about the customer experience. 45 or 8% agree, 7% strongly agree, and a lot of people are neutral. So that one is a little more mixed, right? It's like, can you compensate for technical depth with customer experience insight? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So can you change that perception? Ah, can you change it? So it's the perception that may be of dispute here. Can you change? Okay, good, good point. You know, I, uh, I, uh, I've started to do these surveys on my blog. Um, it started when I was doing a very simple, like, practitioner academic divide survey. And I, so I bought some subscription to a survey tool, and then I was like, you know, before I end this, maybe I'll just start doing more surveys. So I add a bunch of surveys on a lot of blog posts where I'm just like, hey, do you agree or disagree with the stuff I'm arguing? And it's so fun to sort of see where people align. align. Um, and I kind of think that, like, how do we probe into the customer experience and gather w more information about what customers are doing? It might be as simple as, as sending them a quick survey like this uh, when you have different contact points. You know, somebody, we have a little feedback email button in our docs, and if we respond and start a conversation, I'm sure I could attach a survey and gather all kinds of quick information. But, you know, surveys let people know exactly what you're looking for, whereas open feedback can just be all over the place. All right. Uh, We've, we've chatted a long time here, and I've been speaking, and uh, I wanted to say actually that um, anytime you have a question, raise your hand, but we have 15 minutes or so uh, for discussion. I, I'm curious to know, like, what are your thoughts on, on this divide, the technical, technical writer, the less technical writer? you have any, any um, thing you want to say? Yes. Yeah. 
So, you know, no. <laughs> not if you're right. So I, I think there's a disconnect there between what they're asking for and what's, a, and what's available. If the supply is just not there. Yeah. That's kind of my opinion. It, I, I'm just going to summarize it for the recording here. So basically, you're saying that you know, peop, these companies are putting these pie in the sky requirements that don't match, that can't match any sort of rider, and they're going months without finding them because they just don't exist. This sort of super technical person who's also masterful commander of the language and can build great doc sites and can do like marketing collateral and it's like, and understand, you know, the deepest jargon of whatever language they happen to be working on that week. Uh, I actually once. <laughs> yeah. I once saw a job description that, that was like, we want somebody who, who inhales programming languages like on a weekly basis, just out of the pure love of it, who sees code as poetry. And I was like, good luck. You're not gonna find anybody. <laughs> Nobody's looking at, anyway, yes. Yeah, well, that's a great point. You know, it's like the, the whole, the whole uh, process goes askew when you have somebody controlling the hiring process who isn't a technical writer, doesn't understand technical writing. So of course they default to what they know, if it's engineering, and evaluate based on that. And then uh, you have to somehow change that game. And it sounds like um, in your case it worked out well, where you, you were able to kind of change that sort of bias towards engineering knowledge in favor of other skills. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this idea that, that one can clarify and improve documentation just kind of independently as if they're writing in their cube based on their own knowledge and not interacting with SMEs and pulling information out of heads is a total myth, right? It's like, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, okay, other people? Somebody else had a hand up? Yes. Okay. And stuff like that. Because I honestly have to say I am in IT. And um, I honestly have to say that probably 
85%, if not higher, percentage of our technical writers, uh, sorry, of our developers, so the only technical writer, have absolutely no concept of what the customer experience is. They don't care. It's not their job. <laughs> so this is where it gets difficult because I'm under the development as well, but at the same time, upper leadership is saying our customer service skills are crap, and unfortunately, the industry we're in, we have to publish our NPS scores, and then everybody becomes um, goes into this um, bit of this rotation, thinking, "Well, we're just going to throw up and make a new UI, and that's going <laughs> to." The new UI didn't and solve it. Got, and then we get nowhere. I think the whole problem. So I think some other companies, when you get into like healthcare and stuff like that, they're not so much focused on the IT because for the most part, they're buying the IT. You know, they'll buy the software and bring it in, they may have a better idea of what the customer experience is. But yeah, so you, developers so might be able to write for developers, but even as you said in your podcast um, that I read, that I listened to when you talked about that, is how many developers complain that the documentation written by developers isn't any good. Yeah. Yeah, there's another survey I did where I specifically asked people, are you an engineer? And if so, keep taking this survey. And, and one of the questions was, you know, do you prefer to have documentation written by other engineers? And like 40% were kind of agreeing and like 30% are like neutral or no, or it's like, what wasn't this clear? Oh yes, you know, because they realize they're probably like, uh, I'm not sure I want another <laughs> engineer to write docs for me. Um, but yeah, the, this point you bring up about like engineers just being sort of insulated from the customer experience, developing without much input except from the you know, project product manager who who knows where the he or she gets. Yeah, it's poor sketchy requirement. Just like you know, pushing forward with new UIs and new features based on very little input or very little analysis. How do you change that culture to suddenly say, we want to drive our decisions from customer data? I mean, this is another supposed Amazon principle, right? It's like and and industry wide principle. You drive your decisions from your customer data, but uh, if the culture doesn't prioritize that or make it a requirement, you know, it's a, it's maybe look at it as like, hey, there's a huge opportunity to exploit. Nobody else is doing this, you know. Anyway. I just think out of IT, once you get out of the IT more companies, that you'll find, I think, that some other companies understand oh. customer experience. So you're saying this is kind of... This is a sort of a problem that's more common in IT companies, tech companies, rather than companies that develop, like healthcare products, for example. They do a lot more user analysis or something. Okay, good, good point. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, I've got this question before, right? Like, yeah, can AI progress to the point where a lot of the tech docs could be, you know, auto, at least a skeleton version be generated? And I think there's, there's a case to be made for taking the test cases that test QA develops and kind of, you know, automating those into a body. I, I don't know how far AI has progressed to, like, enable more of that, but... I mean, yeah, in some contexts, sure. Uh, I'm skeptical about tech comm contexts. But yeah, I mean, like um, a lot of the. Are humans still going to be needed? The what? Are humans still going to be needed? Or is that way, way far in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, AI is the, the latest huge thing where we're, I think a lot of people are really wondering how that's going to take off. I mean, Google's focusing a tremendous amount of energy on AI. and. You know, with all this data that we have, you think, oh, we're just going to understand what a person wants, right? It's like now on Google, if you search for check-in time, Google knows that you bought tickets, and it's like, I know your confirmation number, and it like appears in the search results page, and it's like, it's kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, um, 
Wait, somebody had her hand up back there first and then there. Yes. We, we've seen this in Gmail just in the last year, right? For example, we've got six openings in my group, and we can't find anybody who's qualified. So you think at that point, it's like, well, all right, we've got an aging population of writers in our group. I don't see any young people. Why don't we train them? <laughs> so you're saying that you're, you're also finding it difficult to find talent that matches up with the job requirements. Yeah, in yeah. our case, it's more system engineering type stuff, okay. database speciality. It's not necessarily programming, or we understand a little bit of scripting. You know, uh, it be well, why is it that companies aren't just like finding a willing mind and putting them through a three-month course? I don't know. We, we spent five months looking for a candidate and finally gave up. Um, well. We rolled in an internal candidate into the position and it sort of didn't work out after that. But like either the person has technical skills but they lack like the, the leadership skills or they have like leadership skills but no technical skills or their writing is like not so great. But they, it's like trying to find somebody who's got like the tech skills, the writing skills and the leadership skills really difficult. And as you've been pointing out, you know, it's, I'm sure this works out in our favor, right? It's like, well, it's nice to be in a job market where uh, even if I don't know all the stuff they want, I'm still a super competitive candidate. Um, yeah, all right, in the front. Yeah, so I just read a book by Thomas Friedman. Okay. He's a journalist with yeah. New York Times. The book is called Thank You for Being Late. He talks about the effect of automation on professions. You know, and there, of course, there's a lot of people are worried about whether they'll have jobs. You know, five years, 10 years from now, right? What he said is that basically AI is a way to do very rudimentary tasks, like for bank tellers, for instance, and that that frees those bank tellers up to do things like sell, sell stocks and bonds for people who come into bank branches. So he was very positive. In fact, that's the entire book, he's very positive about the future. He, you know, he says a lot of things are gonna be, hmm. people's jobs are gonna change, but as long as we, we you know, change for, trends in the future, we should be able to actually be supplemented by AI and, and have more analytical positions going forward. Cool. And that, that's uh, Thomas Friedman. Thank you for being late, you said? Yes. So He's also written The World is Flat. I've read that one a long He's time ago. So he's saying, uh, to try to summarize, that AI is going to kind of handle a lot of these lower level skills, freeing us up for more strategic and creative energies. Like which is... Yeah. Right? I mean, it's commercials for that. It yeah. You look at your grammar and check it very quickly. You, so you don't have to worry about it as much. And, and I've heard people make more extreme arguments too that, like, oh, in, in 10 years, you know, the programming skills aren't going to be needed. Instead, you'll need this more creative, kind of higher level analysis. <laughs> Um, and I'll be interested to see how that happens. I mean, nowadays, when people develop video games, for example, that's not like they're opening up a text editor and coding it all from scratch. Like, they're leveraging these, these frameworks that uh, a lot of times have, like, GUI interfaces where they select and configure different components, and then a whole bunch of code gets written on the back end, right? It's like the idea that, like, you're going to have to code everything from scratch seems like in the long term, hopefully, a lot of that could be, could be uh, minimized. You know, and then, then, well, what about all that time I spent learning Java? You know, I spent three years trying to learn Java, and now I don't even need to know it. Well, that's a difficult, it's part of what makes this so, like, poignant for me. Because this is, this translates into a lot of effort to try to learn technology, right? So, it, it can be empowering. Is it empowering in the long term? I think... <laughs> Even if you don't use those skills, it somehow changes my mind in ways that help me learn uh, and, and maybe do more creative thinking. Yeah. Sorry. No. There was one slide you had when you, when you talked about how the technology is becoming more and more complex, you know, with microservices and 
mm -hmm. everything like that. Yeah. And the APIs. And uh, so, from my perspective, uh, there's not even one engineer that you can go to these days to find out what's happening. You might have to go and talk to like three or four. Like I did a last, I think it was two years ago, I did a systems analysis for a, a deployment. And I literally had to talk to 12 different people to find out, because none of them knew what the entire process was, right? And, and so when you, when you have these kind of systems that are very distributed, the, 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 the fact is you, you, you need more review processes. You need more contributions, you need more crowdsourcing, but everything is going the opposite way because the trend is that they're trying to get as much productivity out of the engineers and keep them isolated. So that, I think, is the problem, is, is from the, the trends that I've seen. They're trying to specialize people more and more, but actually to, to make the documentation work, you know, and to make the UX work and make anything work, you need to have more hmm. collaboration. So, so just to kind of rephrase that, you're saying, you're seeing a trend toward hyper-specialization in a lot of developer projects. And almost an argument for being a generalist to be able to bridge together all the different specialized pieces from so many different parts. Like, if the writer is just a specialist who under, only understands a certain sliver, doesn't really solve this need for somebody to piece together the whole picture. Yeah, and, and you have to gather information from lots of different sources in order to do that. Yeah, this, it, and, and, you know, this idea that, like, a product manager or team gathers specs in a one-time kind of fashion and gives it to the engineers doesn't really fit into the agile world where people are constantly, you know, iterating and developing. It's just continuous. It's like there needs to be this constant flow. And, uh, you know, I, I think there really is a lot of opportunity for doc people to play more CX type um, expertise roles or, or to have more more of an influence there because docs sort of are this intersection of so many different groups internally externally you know it's it's where it seems like this intersection could be a great point to leverage customer insights um, that's one thing I want to explore somebody have their hand up over here no right there That's a good point, good point. So you're saying like you, there's a need sometimes for specific info about a particular problem. Other times you want the whole picture end to end, you know, articulated. Do you think that, uh, you know, a technical writer can, um, would be the best person for that sort of role? Or would you rather have like an engineer write, write that? Or do you want? I think it really comes from two sides. 
Yeah. And I really want to see the technical writer producing it because they're the ones that have the skill with yeah. constructing the words. Okay. Over there. Just as a counterpoint to that, since I actually am doing technical writing on documentation written by programmers, they actually tend to be horrible at being concise. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are actually looking for a quick answer to a problem, you're not going to get it from, from a lot of the programmers doing writing. You actually need somebody to go in and say, okay, you know, you've got this great paragraph about how all these systems interact. Somebody is coming to this page because they've got this issue and they want to know how does this part of the API work? How does it interact mm -hmm. with other things? And what are the gotchas? And it's like, yeah, you need somebody to come in and, and pull it together in a concise form sometimes. Yeah, it, it, this sort of uh, just opens up the difficulty of, of technical documentation, right? Sometimes you want something specific, concise, one sentence. Other times you want a lot more detail and it depends on the person's background. You know, are they new to, to the system? Are they totally experienced and trying to like navigate all those different roles uh, that the users might have or backgrounds and, and needs uh, is certainly challenging. And that's where the, like the focus on the customer has to be in the writer's mind to provide docs that work, right? If you're just focusing on the tech, then you'll tend to write based on your own kind of questions and level of, of, of understanding that you need. So um, thanks. Any last questions? I don't want to keep you guys here too late. I know it's like, you know, a Tuesday. Uh, I just want to, let me come back to my closing slide here. Uh, I just want to say thank you. And if you'd like more information, check out my blog. I'd rather be writing.com. You can also email me and be happy to, uh, to respond or engage otherwise. But thank you again for coming. <laughs>